hot dog. And I gotta say, I've always wanted to be a resident historian someplace, so I'm excited about that. Uh, today's story uh, kind of follows up on what I originally did, which was the, the Gulf of America attack um, in 1942. And two months after that attack, on, on June 19th of 1942, uh, the Germans landed spies, or saboteurs, right here in Ponte Vedra. Uh, they came by submarine, it was a group of four guys. Uh, they came in close to the coast, and uh, they rowed to shore uh, with some of the uh, crewmen on the submarine. And they were wearing uh, Nazi bathing suits. <laughs> and hats. And they were wearing those so that if they got caught, captured as they came ashore, uh, they would be treated uh, as prisoners of war and not as spies. Uh, they changed their clothes. They buried their uh, spy stuff in four boxes. Uh, right down in the 900 block of uh, Ponte Vedra Boulevard. In the dunes. They then, they had ropes attached to the, to the rubber rafts that they used to come ashore, and the submarine uh, crewmen and the rafts were pulled back out to the submarine. Uh, so the only thing they had with them at that point were these four boxes and the clothing they had brought to change into. Uh, their names, you see some of the video, the slides go by. In any event, they, they travel then by foot uh, to Alice B. Landrum's general store, which was also a gas station. Uh, it was the bus stop. And Alice uh, Landrum was the postmistress for Ponte Vedra at that time. So it was, the, it was the post office. And it would have been very, very early in the morning. Uh, one of the spy saboteurs goes into uh, Landrum's store and asks about the bus schedule. Later on, she'll be interviewed about that. And she'll say that she thought that they were just workers from the lodging club, which was being built at that time. It was called the Inlet, I-N-N-L-E-T. So it's sort of a pun. Uh, and she thought they were just workers from there. And she said they didn't sound foreign at all. And the reason that they didn't sound foreign was that all four of these guys had lived in the United States. And one of them was a U.S. citizen. 22-year-old guy named Herbert Haupt. I'm going to talk a lot about Haupt. But Haupt had traveled a long way to get to Ponte Vedra that morning. In the summer of 1941, he had left his home in Chicago. His girlfriend was pregnant. He was of German nationality, uh, pro-German. It was not that unusual prior to Pearl Harbor Day, uh, particularly early on in the Third Reich, for various Americans to be pro-German. Uh, we know uh, Charles Lindbergh, Henry Ford, Joseph Kennedy, just to name three pretty well-known names. He travels to the Mexican border with two friends, both of German uh, descent. Uh, one of them cannot cross the Mexican border. The Haupt and his other friend cross into Mexico. Uh, they go to Mexico City, they go to the German embassy at Mexico City, and they get German passports. They then get on a freighter, and they work their way to Japan. They're in Japan for a brief period of time, they get on another freighter, and they work their way from Japan to Germany, arriving in Nazi Germany just before Pearl Harbor. Haupt's friend joins the Wehrmacht and dies in Stalingrad. Haupt is pulled aside and assigned to this spy squad. And there's 12, initially there's 12 of them. They receive about three weeks of training Four of them drop out, and then the other eight are sent to the United States. And so they land, they go to Alice B. Landrum's uh, post office for over an hour. They take guys, and they go downtown. They uh, split up into groups of two. Two of those people, uh, two of them stand and buy American clothes. The next day, they get on a train. Two of them go to Chicago. Two of them go to Cincinnati. And the plan is that on the 4th of July, they're going to meet up with the other four saboteurs who have landed in, uh, on Long Island, at the very tip of Long Island. And when that group lands, uh, while they're burying their spy supplies, a Coast Guardman named Cullen uh, encounters them. 
And he walks up on him, he hears him speaking German, he gets suspicious. George Dash, who's the leader of that group, attempts to bribe him. And as nearly as I can tell, the numbers keep changing, but as nearly as I can tell, George Dash, who has about uh, 90,000 American dollars on him, gives this guy 260 bucks. Do not tell. And Cullen immediately runs back to his base and uh, turns in $240. And keeps 20 for his trouble. <laughs> And the next day, uh, the Coast Guard and the FBI are out in Long Island. They discover the cache of supplies, uh, and they know. They, this group follows the same pattern as our group. They travel by Long Island Railroad to New York City. They check into two separate hotels. Dash and another of the saboteurs named Berger are in a hotel in New York, and Dash approaches Berger and says, I am going to turn myself in. And you're either going to come with me, or I'm going to throw you out the window. <laughs> Berger, may have, really. Berger may have been of the same mind. And it's always been a debate. Did they, did they plan this in advance? In other words, on the submarine, was Dash already planning to turn himself in? Or did he get scared when Cullen, uh, the Coast Guardsman, intercepted him? We don't really know. In any event, Dash calls the FBI from his hotel room in New York, and he says, essentially, hi, you know, I'm a German spy, and I'd like to turn myself in. And the FBI hangs up on him. I think it's a prank call. <laughs> so they travel, uh, Dash travels to Washington, and he stays at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington. And he again calls the FBI. And they hang up on him a second time. And when he calls the second time, he says he wants to talk to J. Edgar Hoover. He's a German spy, click. Somehow, he eventually convinces them to come to the hotel room. And they do, and they don't believe his story until he takes out his briefcase and empties 84,000 American dollars onto the uh, desk. And the FBI decides at that point, well, maybe there is something to this guy's story because $84,000 in 1942 is a lot of money. Uh, they investigate and they end up uh, arresting all, all eight of them pretty quickly, uh, within a couple weeks, with this information that they get from Dash. Now, Hout has traveled back to his hometown of Chicago. He's going to be one of the last ones arrested. He's 22 years old. He's got $9,000 on him. Oh, Serendipity. Oh, you're controlling it. That's your <laughs> There he is. 22 years old. Uh, June 27, 1942. He's arrested by the FBI. He goes into FBI headquarters to uh, register for the draft and to explain why he has not done so, so far. And he goes in and tells the FBI, I've been traveling. I've been overseas traveling. I'm here. I'm going to... Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, register for the draft. The FBI looks at his name and says, we're, we're looking for this guy. <laughs> but they don't arrest him, they tail him. And he leads them to the final member of the group, uh, Curling. They then have all eight, uh, and they, uh, they bring them all in. How spends his spy money, uh, like every 22-year-old, <laughs> on a new car and an engagement ring for his fiance who now has a child. Her, her name is Kate Ward. Um, the J. Edgar Hoover <coughs> is very interested in the story that his G-men have captured these spies. So he doesn't want anyone to know that Dash and effectively Dash and Berger have, have both turned themselves in. So the story that he presents is that his diligent FBI operatives have foiled a second saboteur plot. The first is the Duquesne plot in January of 1942 where they round up 30 U.S. nationals who are allegedly spying for the Germans. And FDR wants these guys killed. They haven't done anything. 
Now they've got, they've got dynamite, they've got TNT, they've got explosives shaped like um, coal to put into, into freight trains, to blow up freight trains. They've got a list of targets. They've got a list of people to, uh, who, who may help them written on invisible ink on a handkerchief. Uh, when the FBI attempts to read that invisible ink, uh, they have Dash's help, but he can't remember how to make the ink appear. And so the FBI does figure that out on their own, but da Dash doesn't know. That's a good one, the guy digging up the, the stuff. Eventually, they, eventually they'll come down here and dig up their stuff. Uh, FBR wants these guys killed. Uh, he wants them executed. Uh, he, he would prefer that they be hung. Uh, but he can't do that in a civilian court because they haven't really done anything long, wrong. So they, they form a military court with five generals. Seven generals. Seven generals. And the seven generals have a trial in Washington, D.C. And they convict all eight of these uh, saboteurs to death. After the trial, FDR sees the trial transcript and for the first time realizes that Dash and Berger uh, have voluntarily surrendered. And so he commutes their death sentences uh, to 25 years of hard labor for Dash and life for Berger. Dash will ultimately, both Dash and Berger will ultimately be, uh, their sentences commuted and they will be released from prison in 1948 mm. by Harry Truman. They get sent back to Germany. They, on an annual basis, Berger, or excuse me, Dash writes a letter uh, to J. Edgar Hoover asking to be allowed back into the United States. Every Christmas, he sends Harry Truman a Christmas card. <laughs> they never let him back. Uh, they have a hard time in Germany because they're traitors. Nobody in Germany particularly likes these guys. They've turned in their fellows, six of whom die, in the electric chair on the third <laughs> floor of the Washington, D.C. jail. And um, to give them the trial. There's a picture of the outside. Uh, they turned off the electricity at the jail. Turned off all the lights because the electric chair used so much electricity that the lights would flicker and they didn't want anyone outside to know that these, that these executions had taken place. And those take place on August the 8th, 1942. So they land June 19th, less than two months later, they're dead. 68 are dead. It was, it was swift justice. And there's some argument, part of their, part of their um, Defense was that they, 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 were, they never planned to do any of this. They had a list of targets. The targets included the New York City water supply, uh, the dams at, uh, in Tennessee, Tennessee Valley, uh, the dam at Niagara Falls, hydroelectric plants in both cases, aluminum plants near the Tennessee Valley Administration, and Horseshoe Bend, uh, which is a kind of a half circle of railroad track. If you've ever seen it near Altoona, it was very popular. Uh, tourist destination even at that time. You could look out, you could be in the front of the train, look out the train, and see the back of the train. Uh, and it went through a pass, and it was a critical pass. A lot of rail transport went through Horseshoe Bend. They were supposed to blow that up as well. Uh, they never had much of a chance. There they are outside the jail. I like that one. They never had much of a chance. Hout um, has gone home to his parents. And he's living with his parents uh, when he gets engaged to his fiance Kate Morgan. Uh, the government decides to try them as well. So ultimately, his fiance, his mother, his aunt, and his father are all tried for treason. Uh, they all are stripped of their American citizenship. Um, the father is sentenced to death. That's later commuted to life. The three women are, are sentenced to 25 years of peace plus a $10,000 fine. They will remain in jail longer than Dash and Burke. And they'll eventually be released and also deported back to Germany. Um, kind of a gruesome story. There's, by the way, there's Haupt and Dash with the, uh, anybody know what rank that guy is? 
some sort of a military guy in between the lieutenant. guard. Yeah, it looks like a single bar lieutenant. I think that's what I'm thinking too, lieutenant. <clears throat> um, I don't, I feel bad for these guys in some ways, uh, but I also want to make a point. Um, they came here, they were saboteurs. The fact that they were not particularly committed saboteurs, uh, that they were bungling saboteurs, <laughs> inept saboteurs, probably doesn't uh, uh, fully relieve them of guilt. Uh, but they, they died here. Oh, uh, one other thing. I'll, I'll use this at the end because I meant to say it earlier. Uh, Alice B. Landrum's husband is Sheriff Roy Landrum. And he, there are more pictures of, of Roy Landrum than there are of Alice. Uh, most of the pictures of Roy Landrum are pictures of Roy uh, busting up stilts. There's a lot of moonshiners in Palm Valley. And uh, election time, uh, the sheriffs would all go out and bust up stills and get their pictures in the paper to get reelected. And they didn't do too much between then. But, you know, that guy came and talked to us about the brewery down, or the distillery down in St. Augustine. If anybody wants a business like this, Palm Valley Shine was considered to be the best moonshine in this area. <laughs> And uh, Osterhauser was a big shiner. And so he, he flavored his moonshine with palmetto berries and charred peaches. So we even have a recipe to make this moonshine. Palm Valley shine. <laughs> Sell it on the market. Talk that guy to the story. In any event, that, that's, oh, good. I'm glad that's there. The, these guys didn't do anything. They didn't blow up anything. They did not. Um, poison any water supplies. They did not create the reign of terror the way the German uh, uh, there uh, envisioned it. But what they did do was we ended up putting thousands of guys on the beach, like this guy on the white horse, looking for more spies. They, so they did succeed in tying up tens of thousands of man hours of us looking for the next group of spies that essentially never comes. <coughs> Thanks. This is my first time doing it. Uh, I liked it. I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs>